The Obituary Show, presented by Barry Ferns. He was a character. He said to me, I like to work with intelligent men, but real men. I want their brains big and their balls bigger. Have you got big balls, bub? He shouted at me. Then he grabbed my crotch and asked me the capital of Nepal. Legendary wrestler Bob the Hatchet O'Halloran there, talking about Horatio Pork Turkey, who died this week after suffering a massive suicide. Pork Turkey started his career as a wrestler, but, of course, it is Hollywood that immortalised him, hurtling him into the collective consciousness with films such as Hellkeeper, Robofist, Jurassic Fist, Cro-Magnon Fist, Medieval Fist, Roman Fist, Industrial Fist, and Techno Fist. Terms of Death, The Exploders, Face Smash, Death from the East, and Mean Girls 3, The Meanest Girl, and of course the global success of the biopic I'm Superman. Look at me. Look at me, I'm the actual real-life Superman. And then, of course, there was Horatio's part in film history itself, with one of the most iconic and unexpectedly successful films of the last 50 years. A film that gave us a slew of catchphrases that became part of our everyday lives. Here's Academy Award-winning director John Cove on that film. The, fi- the film really caught the public imagination, and soon you had deadpan quips like, it's cash back time, I won't be back. And they were being regurgitated in playgrounds, workplaces, brothels all over the world. Everyone wanted a piece of pork turkey. But more from John Cove later, because it was professional wrestling where Horatio Pork Turkey first rose to fame. And in that regard, let's hear more from fellow wrestler and friend, Bub the Hatchet O'Halloran. I remember the first time I saw him in action. It was at an exhibition tournament. I was up next, so I went to watch the current fight from the wings. It was reaching its conclusion. One man reeling, another strutting. But the crowd were going mad for the strutting guy in the ring. Their arms to the heavens, and they were all chanting, Gobble! 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 Who the fuck? fuck is that? I asked my trainer, transfixed. That, he said, is Horatio Pork Turkey, the pastor of disaster. And that's when I saw it. One of the most remarkable finishing moves of the era. The father, the son, and the Holy Ghost. It sure wasn't technically perfect, but it was undoubtedly One of the most ostentatious and ornate moves that era of wrestling ever saw. Here is a recording of Horatio himself explaining that very move in his own words. This was my move in the ring. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The first stage of the move is the Father. This move comes from the hugs my dad used to give me as a child. My father is smothering me in his warm, buttery breast, making me feel like the happiest crumpet in the world. This move arouses in my opponent a childlike impotence, a helplessness. He becomes dependent on me. Then, in the blink of an eye, I perform the Son. For this move, I spin my adversary around and leap onto his shoulders, placing the burden of responsibility on him. I become a child in his mind and I whisper in his ear things like, Can I have some candy floss, Daddy? How long until Christmas, Daddy? Daddy, why is there no television? Is it because you've neglected to pay the bills, Daddy? Why is Mummy crying all the time, Daddy? At this point, my opponent would drop to 
to his knees, a broken man. And then I would perform the Holy Ghost. Inspired by the film Ghost, I would sit behind my adversary and gently wrap my arms and legs around his waist. Then, with my hands on his, I would suggestively mime the sculpting of a huge cock-shaped pot. This final move emasculated the massive, confident, leotarded man that had entered the ring and would leave behind a sexually confused child father. Port Turkey is king. For his peerless finishing move, showmanship and trash talk, Horatio Port Turkey was rightly respected in the professional wrestling world. But it was not until acclaimed wrestling expose, Tossing Gristle, revealed a natural charisma and magnetism in front of the camera that the rest of the world suddenly began to sit up and take notice. His debut film role, a terrifying turn as a cyborg sent back from the future to get a full refund on an unworn sweatshirt, made him an unlikely global film star and gave him unprecedented power within the studios. His biographer, James Dean. Nobody thought Cashback was going to be a success. I mean, this low-budget B-movie, no stars, no advertising. The script was based on Woolworth's refund policy, for God's sake. I mean, it just no... What chance did it have? But then in the middle of it, pork turkey's there just playing it straight. It worked. People just bought it. I mean, everywhere you would hear it. And then you'd walk down the street and people would be saying, does this affect my statutory rights? I will not be back. It's cashback time. A total commitment that led to an authenticity that reached right through the silver screen. It's the only thing that explains the insane and unlikely success of cashback. James Dean. You believe that he really was this murderous, cold-hearted killing machine that was part of an AI conspiracy to totally wipe out the human race by bankrupting the retail sector. He made you believe that. He made it real. By the end of that film, the audience needed that cyborg to get his refund, no matter what condition that sweatshirt was in, and no matter what the consequences would be for the entire human race. A strew of box office hits followed, as well as the Fist series. There was Top Bollock, about a maverick testicular cancer surgeon that made him a heartthrob for teenage girls and a hero for retired gentlemen. There was Menage a Four, a modern updating of The Three Musketeers, which bought him his fifth box office number one. And then, of course, Cashback 2. This product does not match item description on website or in catalogue. But sadly, pork turkey was not to everyone's tastes, especially the critics. Here, the film critic Pauline Snipe appraises Cashback on the BBC's Culture Show. The guns glistened, the muscles glistened, the cars glistened, the tits glistened, the teeth glistened, even the blood glistened, everything glistened, except the pathetic script. The script was as grey and dead as my father-in-law, only less racist. Give a monkey a typewriter and he might, might, one day create the complete works of Shakespeare. Give a monkey a crayon and within the hour he will create the complete works of pork turkey, guaranteed. The critical vitriol that greeted every pork turkey release wounded Horatio massively more than his adoring public realised. He was unused to such harsh and denigrating criticism, especially because as a wrestler, he'd always enjoyed the respect of his peers. His mother, Julie Pork Turkey. It hurt, of course it hurt. But it hurt Horatio more than most. All Horatio had ever wanted to be was the hero, and these reviews painted him as the villain. All his good intentions backfired for him. His attempts to create enjoyable films for all the family were interpreted as cynical moves to dumb down popular culture and make himself rich in the process. His preference for working class characters and accents to give the poorer in society a sense of hope and example were seen as elitist and cynical. 
Even his setting up of a charitable foundation that benefited from 70% of his income and eventually helped eradicate polio in the developing world was seen as a publicity stunt for his film, RoboFist 2, The Fist of All the Robots. He had money, success, friends, family, millions of adoring fans. His films spread happiness all around the world, but the critics hated him. And that was all that mattered to my darling Horatio. It destroyed him. Scarred immeasurably by the rejection, after ten years of box office hits, including his most recent Christmas comedy smash, A Full Sack for Sammy, and a Broadway musical version of Stallone's Rambo 3, Pork Turkey couldn't handle it any longer, and developed an all-encompassing desperation, chasing that elusive critical approval. His agent, Michael Hans. I shouldn't have let him do it. I could tell he was burned out. But when he asked to be in the biopic of Christopher Reeve, it, it felt like the role was made for him. He could give it a gravitas, a meaning that was resonant with his own role in Hollywood. However, for Horatio, he felt it was his chance to go for critical acclaim, perhaps an Oscar, by giving everything to the role. <laughs> That's what he did. He insisted, insisted that he be injured in the exact same way as Christopher Reeve so that he could act the role as authentically as possible. I mean, he was so persuasive. Obviously, it's clear now it was a really stupid idea. Obviously, I had no idea the risks involved. He kept them from me. The rest, of course, is written in the tabloids of 2012. When Pork Turkey arrived on set, having the night before had an operation to break two cervical vertebrae in his neck, leaving him quadriplegic and needing an oxygen pump to breathe and two full-time carers. John Cove, the director of the biopic, had the shock of his life. I had the shock of my life. When he arrived on set that day, we all just presumed it was a joke, a really, really bad joke. There was a, a deathly silence on set. No one understood what was happening or if it was part of some you know, bigger plan. And as Pork Turkey was wheeled in and he explained what he'd done in halting it breathless sentences and then loudly soiled himself. Oh, all hell broke loose. There were screams, tears from the crew. It was pandemonium. His biographer, James Dean, was also on set that day, shadowing Pork Turkey for his biography. I think it was, it was the most shocking day I've ever had at work. It was crazy. It was pandemonium. I mean, one of the producers actually punched Pork Turkey in the face. That's true. He actually punched a quadriplegic in the face. And then the whole thing, the, the whole circus happened and the, the film set was a news bulletin and all this crazy stuff was happening and there was Oprah interviews and there was lawsuits and flying donkeys. There were f tiny men dressed as umbrellas, the drones flying over the set day and night. Christopher Reeve's widow sued Horatio publicly for damages she lost, but... The director, John Cove, again. Amid all this, Horatio was, he was passionately insistent that we carry on filming. It, it was a nightmare at this point in the filming schedule. We were still like filming, filming the able-bodied scenes for the Christopher Reeve character. So we had to get a body double in and use CGI to finish them. And we had to carry on filming because he planned this very, very carefully. And to be honest, I... I don't know why I didn't put two and two together when he asked for this clause in the contract, and I'll read it out now. If the lead actor during filming decides to have an operation to give him the exact same injury as Christopher Reeve, then the filming would continue and there would be no psychiatric assessment of the lead actor. Everyone should carry on totally as normal as if it's the most normal thing in the world. And the rest is, of course, film history. The biopic was one of the highest grossing films of all time. Pork Turkey's performance was loved by audiences all around the world, with it being number one for 42 weeks straight. 
It changed laws in 32 different countries about how stem cells were used for research. It led to a watershed moment for rights for the disabled worldwide. But, but critics slammed pork turkey for what they saw as the most cynical publicity stunt of all. And it received two or less stars across the board. Defeated and drained, pork turkey had been hurt for the last time by the critics. And with a huge fortune of $400 million, Pork Turkey turned from creating work in the public eye and sought solace and succor in his very first love, the supreme joy of his childhood. Mollusks. Mollusks were his very first love. They were his safe space, his cocoon, his mucal sanctuary. As a child, he believed he could talk to the slugs. He used to counsel and encourage them, convinced that a lot of slugs were down on their luck and depressed. He had a passionate belief that slugs came from the same family as snails and that bad life choices had just left them homeless. With this in mind, he would grab his plastic bucket, trot down the beach, gather up seashells and then bring them back and start housing the chubby little grotesques. It drove his father mad. Eventually, he sat Horatio on his lap, told him straight. Horatio, he said, slugs are susceptible to salt. And the ocean is a salty tract if ever there was one. And seashells are magically imbued with the sound of the ocean. So, all of your tenants live with the sound of impending death crushing against their skulls. And thus began what turned out to be the final chapter of Pork Turkey's life. Mollusk World was a $300 million theme park set in rural Florida. Designed as a family day out, its centerpiece, a huge shell-like dome, that Horatio Pork Turkey had in mind would be a safe home for disadvantaged gastropod mollusks. Many will of course remember, potentially with a shiver, the advertising for it that played on every media channel for months and months. What are you doing sitting there listening to this advert? You should come down to Horatio Pork Turkey's Mollusk World. Mollusk World is a fun day out for the whole family, filled with 32 exciting roller coasters and over 50,000 slugs. 50,000 slugs! And even more slug-related attractions. Take a trip down the Mucus River in real-life gastropods. Travel the park in biologically accurate mucal bubbles. Fly on the Polymer Network monorail passing through the magical tree snail jungle. Or explore the world of barnacles and sea slugs in the slimy submarine. You can even adopt your very own slug and give it a home. So come down and have yourself a slug-filled adventure. You will arrive as a human, but you will leave as a mollusk. That's a fact. You might even have your own slime trail. Come for the slugs, but stay for the adventure. It was a slug paradise. However, it wasn't a public paradise. Sadly, very, very few others shared pork turkey's slug love. And, for the first time, the public turned against Horatio Pork Turkey. Parents and children began to eye him with a distance and suspicion. For the first time, he wasn't one of them. He wasn't an everyman. He was an outcast. He was different. He was a weird and ignoble and pathetic failure. The irony, of course, was that critics loved it. It got five stars across the board. Brian Logan of The Guardian called it a triumph of alienation and hard-nosed rational biology over the tediously accessible and cathartic joy that has characterised Pork Turkey's career up until now. Finally, Horatio Pork Turkey has created something I can connect with. But critical success didn't pay the bills, and only 18 months after its grand opening, it closed. A $200 million flop. After its closure, Horatio Pork Turkey, or Slug Man, as he was now known by the public, withdrew entirely from the public eye. Julie Pork Turkey. He would never leave the mansion again. The last time I saw him alive, he put the shell to his ear and said, Mummy, I can hear the sea coming. 
I should have known something was wrong. The next time I saw him, he was sitting on his own shoulders, grotesquely distorted and, as you can imagine, totally dead. And thus echoes a life revertebrate into silence. Never has Horatio Port Turkey's infamous catchphrase, I'll not be back, been more apt. He is survived by his mother, two brothers, and 158,000 slugs. Horatio Pork Turkey, 1965 to 2020. This episode was written by Barry Ferns and Richard Todd. It was edited by Joshua Barker and Barry Ferns, and it was performed by Arthur Smith, David Mills, John Gordillo, Kate Barella, and Barry Ferns. It was a Barry Ferns production for Barry Ferns by Barry Ferns for Barry Ferns. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of The Obituary Show. If you liked it or would like to help make more, you can for as little as $1 a month by going to my Patreon page. Patreon members get exclusive rewards if you'd like that as well, like early scripts of each episode and extra audio tracks that weren't used in the final edit. Or if you're that way inclined, you can even design a death yourself or become part of the episodes in other ways. You also get exclusive access to all my other fictional worlds and can find out what else I do, like videos, live streams, comedy clubs, events. I do many, many things. Essentially, if you like what I do, please be my patron. Essentially, be my Peggy Guggenheim. Or to put it another way. All I'm looking for is a Peggy Guggenheim. Be my Peggy Guggenheim, baby. All I'm looking for is a Peggy Guggenheim. Be my Peggy Guggenheim, baby. All I'm looking for is a Peggy Guggenheim. Be my Peggy Guggenheim, baby. All I'm looking for is a Peggy Guggenheim. Be my Peggy Guggenheim, baby. Yeah, exactly that, I think.